The issue of mica and pyrite in homes across parts of Donegal, Mayo and Sligo has been prominent in the news in recent years. We can only imagine the difficulties experienced by thousands of families impacted by this, and indeed the emotional and financial stress that goes with that. At the outset, we acknowledge that there are many factors that contribute to this issue, such as standards, procedures, controls and regulations. But there are also other factors, such as geology, aggregate production, climate and exposure, building defects, insurance, liability, and many more. To be clear, at the outset, we want to emphasize that we're not trying to cover all of those issues tonight. This talk is focused on the technical analysis of concrete blocks, which in itself is a surprisingly broad subject. We are very grateful to have Dr. Robbie Goodhue as our guest speaker tonight. Robbie is a senior experimental officer at Trinity College Dublin and director of Fastness Analytical Limited. His research focuses largely on building materials. Robbie is also a member of the NSAI Technical Committee for Aggregates, where he has worked on various national standards, such as SR21, IS398, SR16, and IS465. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to your speaker for this evening, Dr. Robbie Goodhue. Thank you very much, Seamus. Uh, good evening, all. Um, I'm going to uh, pack quite a lot into the next 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, I apologize if the pace is rather fast, but in order to tell my story, I have to squeeze quite a lot of information into it. So um, the, um, sorry, um, talk outline, uh, which was publicized is to explain the procedures used in the standard IS-465 which is, was written to assess the risk of degradation of aggregate concrete masonry units, or termed concrete blocks. We're going to consider some deleterious materials. Part two, I'm going to provide my opinion on the current knowledge gaps in the standard. And the final part will propose some new methods for assessing concrete block durability. As Seamus said, the standard is uh, a, a a complete standard in terms of assessment and categorization of the building and uh, remediation options, but I'm only going to talk about the testing. The standard was uh, written between September 2017 and November 2018. And for me, one of the core pieces is this figure, figure three, which describes the pattern or the, the process uh, that you run through in testing. And it's divided into three test suites, A, B, and C. Uh, and the first test suite is simplified petrography, perhaps a bit of a misnomer because there's, there can be a bit more to it than a, just a brief look. Uh, the standard requires that there's a visual assessment, and this can be made with a hand lens or a binocular or microscope. And it also uh, suggests that the sample is washed to remove loose material. I actually disagree with this approach and anywhere I disagree with something or have an opinion, I put it in a blue uh, uh, italicized text. And I'll come to why in a minute. So the process I do, which is not the same as every lab because each lab has their own thing, is to take a, a vacuum saw, which is a dry blade on it, and I carefully cut a 40 millimeter thick ring. I then blast it out with compressed air and I weigh it immediately. And this gives me the uh, as received mass of the concrete. So it's the, the concrete and the water it contains. I then dry it in, a, in an oven at 40 degrees centigrade until constant mass is, is achieved, which usually takes about three days. And this allows the calculation of how much water is in the sample. And you'll see that water will become a key theme in my talk. I then complete the petrographic description and I use a binocular microscope. Uh, I also use a scanner to provide a, a, a nice image of the clean cut surface. And I take a series of photographs that examine the material and describe it. And here's an example of some of the Dunny, typical Donegal stuff. So we have different uh, item, different uh, aggregate identified across the section. So you can see we've got samite, these metamorphic, 
uh, sandstones and metapelites, metamorphic mud rocks and uh, other things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into the, the specifics of this. We can also look at the cement matrix. So the top left-hand uh, panel shows that. And you can see there's a scale bar that's 0 0.2 millimeters in that panel. And we it quickly reached the limit of uh, what we can see with basic uh, optical microscopes. We look at the void contents, any cracks, and anything that might be there that could be considered deleterious. And at the end of that, the idea is that the professional geologists should be able to assign uh, hopefully the risk assessment in terms of it being negligible, low, medium, or high, or higher critical, based on what they can uh, determine. But there is an allowance then if, if they can't, if they're unhappy that they've seen enough, uh, they can uh, go to test suite B where conclusive evidence of deterioration has not been observed, or the absence of potentially problematic lithologies, minerals have not been confirmed. The intention was that for many of the properties assessed, test suite A would be sufficient. But the reality is that in many and nearly all, uh, test suite B has been um, uh, called upon. So this has uh, two different pathways, one for uh, free muscovite mica on the left, and the second for suspected pyrite on the right. They share a detailed thin section uh, photography. Detailed thin section photography is using a different type of microscope, a much higher magnification, and it has both plane and polarized uh, light and reflected light. And you make thin, you use thin sections, which are 30 micron or uh, 0.03 millimeter thick slices of rock that are highly polished. And the level of detail we can see in thin section photography is much higher. So we can use the polarizer to identify different minerals and we can shine light through this, the thin section and onto the thin section. And we can see things at, at a much, much higher magnification. So here we have a mica shifts in the top left, the, one of these metapelites, these fine grained uh, metamorphic mud rocks in the top right, a uh, samite in the bottom left and a meta gray whack, another common rock type in the, in the metamorphic trains in Donegal on the bottom right. And again, we can start to see uh, th things in the cement matrix. So we're particularly interested in the free mica. These are uh, less than 63 micron slivers of muscovite mica. And we can get a, an idea and, and quantify them at that stage. And we can see other deleterious materials, uh, pyrotite and pyrite. If we look at the a similar thin section for Mayo, you can see instantly it's a very different looking animal that the, the thin section is, has a lot of dark grains in it. These are uh, dark limestones that are very fine grained uh, with the muddy matrix. And in that there are, are uh, fragments of fossil grains. Uh, so we see this in the top left. It's important for the uh, pyrite type material that we make a thin section because a lot of the pyrite that is particularly problematic is very fine grained uh, and we can see it in the bottom right. The scale bar on that is 20 microns, so 0 0.02 of a millimeter. And you can see that the, the little bright grains of pyrite are really small, maybe less than a micron, many of them. Test suite B then for the mica pathway calls on X-ray diffraction. And this is an analytical technique that I have used for, for years. It allows the identification of mineral species and their quantification above what we term a lower limit of detection, which can be anything from 1.5 to 2% depending on the mineral species. So we won't see perhaps something at low concentration that is deleterious but we will see things at higher concentration. Test suite B also includes a compressive strength in the muscovite mica path, but not on the suspected pyrite path. And this may be a, a, an oversight and may need to be uh, revised in time. This is a standard method. Uh, engineers will be most familiar with it, where effectively you compress the concrete until it fails and you record the uh, the force that's required to compress it. So IS465 calls for a minimum of one sample from the rising wall and one sample from the inner leaf.
uh, in compressive strength. Then for the pyrite pathway, uh, chemical testing was favored. So there's total sulfur and acid soluble sulfate to another European standard. And this is uh, analyzing the bulk crushed concrete. Uh, so it's the aggregate and the cement binder and any additives that might be in there. And effectively, chemical methods are used to extract the sulfur and sulfate, uh, two different methods, and then precipitate them from solution. And this precipitate is weighed, and from that, uh, total sulfur and acid soluble sulfate is calculated. There's also the requirement for cement content analysis in the pyrite pathway. And this uh, IS465 suggests that the results must be treated with caution and are not definitive. Uh, this is because there's a lot of assumptions or a few assumptions made on uh, how the cement content is calculated. You, you, you can't always reverse engineer and know exactly what went into a concrete block. So you, sometimes you have to assume that it was a SEM1 Portland cement and that a certain amount of silica is in the aggregate. If the assumptions are correct, the, the uh, cement content results are very useful. If they're incorrect, they can be misleading. But we can use the data from this and the thin section petrography to help determine the risk from pyrite oxidation. So the, at the end of the test suite B for either pathway, what we aim to do is to combine all the information we've uh, accumulated and come up with a risk assessment. In some cases then, it may be uh, recommended that scanning electron microscopy with elemental analysis is used for quantitative mineralogical analysis. So this is the first part of test suite C. Here we have a, a very fancy uh, electron microscope from Trinity College with uh, big energy dispersive detectors on it. And in the right-hand panel, we have some of this framboidal or raspberry-like pyrite. And we have a little red box that indicates the area that is analyzed above. So this is a conventional way of uh, more or less spot analysis of framboids. Technology has really moved on now and we can produce uh, false color elemental maps. So effectively, the elemental detectors can scan over the whole area of interest and can determine what concentrations are of elements. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can actually outline which elements you want for, for this. It's sulfur and pyrite, sorry, sulfur and iron, I beg your pardon. Uh, and these can be combined. And what you can see on the left-hand image is a framboid towards the bottom that has an orange rim where the iron is remaining and a, a kind of a greenish core where the sulfur and iron are remaining. So the, this is absolute unequivocal uh, information that the, that framboid has oxidized from the outside and the sulfur has gone off and actually attacked the cement matrix close to the framboid. You can see holes close to it. So this is very useful in pyrite, but it's also very useful in the free mica route because we can use additional software, uh, which um, is called feature analysis, that will actually allow us to define the chemical composition of mica and then identify it from the elemental map. And this is a technique that uh, an MSc student, uh, uh, a member of staff from Trinity College, Leona O'Connor, developed. I will caution this though, that I think SEM uh, is, is a really powerful technique, but it should really be used as much as possible as a research tool and should be used sparingly for routine analysis. It just, it, it takes too long in it to analyze samples simply. Okay, I promised I'd say something about some deleterious materials. I'm not going to say a whole lot because you can go online and you can look up absolutely reams of useful information. Pyrite is iron disulfide. It's a most abundant sulfide mineral and it occurs in sedimentary metamorphic and igneous rocks. And it occurs in various forms uh, like cubes, euhedral, raspberry-like framboids and irregular shaped masses anhedral. Uh, some pyrite is unstable in atmospheric conditions and oxidizes to produce sulfuric acid. And we've, we talked about that and I mentioned that in the SEM. 
uh, the reaction can result in new minerals such as the growth of gypsum and the precipitation may result in forceful expansion. And this idea of the pyrite to gypsum reaction uh, was uh, really at the center of the, uh, I suppose, the thesis on the Dublin and surrounding counties, the pyrite problem where you had expanding subfloors. Uh, this knowledge was then brought into IS465 uh, and informed. So we, we may became with a, a mindset that the problems were all related to minerals rather than to other things. I have to stress that pyro, uh, concrete is a complex composite material and there's many additional factors in addition to the aggregate and in addition to deleterious materials that we must take into account. So the, the particle size distribution or grading of the rock, there's a water absorption of the rock and the concrete, there's a cement content, there's a water cement ratio in manufacture, and there's a compaction in voids. And all of these interplay uh, with each other to make a durable or not durable concrete. We should not automatically assume that all problems with concrete relates to excess deleterious materials and aggregate uh, for that reason. Moving on to mica then, uh, they are sheet silicates. They form these big flat sheets. Uh, muscovite is the most common of the mica minerals. And uh, it's common in igneous and metamorphic rocks but it can also be present in detrital grains and sedimentary rocks. I find it often in XRD in fairly clean limestones. So my take home message from this is we should not specify mica-free concrete as really this may not exist. We have to think about how much and uh, not automatically say, uh, specify that we need mica-free. Um, the Donegal metamorphic rocks are mica bearing and when these rocks are crushed to make aggregate they liberate quite a lot of uh, fines which are grains that are less than 63 microns termed free mica and it's believed that this excess free mica uh, will increase the water demand during concrete manufacture and this can alter the micro porosity of the and the water absor absorption of the finished uh, masonry, concrete masonry blocks. And the following on from that, IS465 says that saturated concrete may be susceptible to degradation from freeze thaw action. Now, this is something I actually demonstrated uh, uh, early on and to the committee. Uh, I took a, a piece of the Donegal, the Inishone type material. Uh, I had a control sample that I kept dry and then I saturated no, another one and I just put it through a, a number of freeze thaw cycles. You can see 4, 8, 10, 12, 16, 20, 24. And you see progressively it crumbles under its own weight. Uh, so it's very easy to demonstrate. However, the dry concrete uh, remained uh, apparently unaltered in the freeze thaw. And again, I will stress that uh, concrete is a complex composite material. And there's more to concrete than just free mica. Uh, so we have to be very careful. And IS465 uh, does not set a limit on the um, amount of free mica that's allowable and asks the geologist to quantify in terms of absent, rare, common, numerous, and abundant and define what they actually mean by these terms. Uh, we really have to be very careful that we should not make assumptions on how much free mica is too much. And there's a, there's a, unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, focus on that, which is, I think, not always correct. Now, finally, I'm going to mention pyrotite. This is uh, similar to iron, uh, to pyrite in that it's an iron and sulfur bearing mineral, but the iron to sulfur ratio is closer one to one or 0.8 to, to one. Uh, it was previous to this, it was thought to be rare in Ireland. I think the GSI database only had six occurrences. It occurs in volcanic and metamorphic rocks primarily. And interestingly, pyrotite is specifically mentioned in several standards as a deleterious material. And in cases where pyrotite is found, the total sulfur of the aggregate 
uh, is limited to 0.1%. This is a, a standard SR16 aggregates for concrete and the European standard that supports this. So it, it really it shouldn't be there if the sulfur uh, shouldn't be used as aggregate if the sulfur is more than 0.1%. However, and this is a big however, uh, most of the oxidation of the pyrotite that we have observed, and this is several labs, not, not just uh, myself, uh, uh, is it, most of the oxidation appears to be prior to concrete manufacture. So it's oxidized and then it's been incorporated in the block. And unfortunately, we do not know the time frame in which pyrotite oxidation will impact the durability of the concrete. And this is an area that really requires research. So I'll, I'll come back to this towards the end. So that's part one. Now I'm gonna go on to part two, opinion on some knowledge gaps. I mentioned the, the uh, water being an important thing and not wetting the core and um, my determining the mass percent water. This is because one of the things that we're asked to comment on in IS465 is the moisture condition. But this, the standard provides no guidance at all on the moisture condition and how it should be recorded. Uh, should it just be a verbal uh, dry, damp, wet, or should it be more advanced? And this is potentially very valuable data, which is lost as water plays a major role in degradation. As I said before, dry concrete won't freeze. Uh, water is a strong leaching agent for cement matrix if you have it flowing through concrete and water is a reactant in pyritic oxidation. So it's a, it's a really key uh, core th theme of this talk. This is simply my calculation of mass percent water. It's very simple. You just weigh it wet, dry it, re-weigh it, and you can work out how much. So for this example, it turns out that there's 2.63 mass percent water. This would be if you had a 20 kilo standard four inch or 100 mil block would hold about 52.6 grams of water. It's quite a lot of water. If you add that up over the uh, uh, facade, it's a lot of water. And this data is uh, at 472 determinations from individual cores that I looked at. Uh, on the left, we have a cores from Donegal and on the right from County Mayo. And these are histograms which show uh, the mass percent water on the uh, x-axis, on the horizontal axis, and the number of cases in, on the y-axis, on the vertical axis. Now, the interesting thing is that if you take uh, concrete and you leave it to equilibrate with moisture and atmospheric air, uh, you will probably end up with a um, amount of water between 0.15 and 0.61 mass percent. So I've put this on each graph as a vertical green line. So if the concrete was just left in the, in the dry and not in contact with liquid water, that's where you'd see it. So everything to the right of that is in contact with liquid water. And you can see that some of the concrete in Donegal, particularly if you look at the outer leaves, these are colored in blue, are really, they're not just damp or wet, they're absolutely saturated. It's though they're sitting in water. Same for Mayo, with a lot of, lot of water in the outer leaf, less so in the inner leaf. And will the, the sub DPC uh, beneath ground level, that's expected to be wet. And here's the same data just shown numerically. Uh, what I want to point out is that the average of all this uh, data for the outer leaf in Donegal is about 2.63%. It's about, it's a bit higher than the average for the outer leaf in Mayo. So this suggests that the Donegal uh, concrete, for want of a better word, is more uh, likely to absorb water than the Mayo stuff, uh, but the Mayo stuff is not far behind it. It's all what I would call wet to saturated, really. Okay. Now, the importance of the water absorption uh, of aggregate concrete is not lost, and there is actually a standard, uh, an EN, ICN 772 part 11, which determines the coefficient of water absorption. This is a simple test method, which uh, when you uh, take a, a cube of concrete or a block, 
you put it in five millimeters of uh, water um, and then you let the water saturate through the face for a, t a 10 minute duration. So the red box is on the right. And you can see that the, the two blocks I've shown have different uptake of water, but within 10 minutes, the water through capillary action has vertically risen to about a third of the height of, of that block on the top and much less on the bottom. Uh, we've done a bit of experimentation and there's this is with Paul Quigley and Michael Robinson is also involved in this. And there's a very large range of results uh, in, in new blocks. But unfortunately, there's no limit placed on the coefficient of water absorption in the standards. And we don't know if water absorption is really a good proxy for freeze thaw resistance, yet it is something that most manufacturers would quote. Now, the relevance for, of water ingress really comes down to, in my opinion, to this standard, the Eurocode 6 SR325. And what it says in, in one section is that rain penetration is one of the commonest building defects and that in cavity walls, some water will inevitably penetrate the outer masonry leaf in prolonged periods of wind-driven rain. So what it's saying to me is that in Ireland, rain will inevitably penetrate the outer leaf. This is of core importance because the specification for uh, masonry units, if they're exposed, is that you the manufacturer will declare the the absorption by capillarity, the coefficient of water absorption, or they were put on not to be left exposed. Um, and this is obviously a, a bit of an issue because many manufacturers will leave them exposed in the yard. And also once they leave the, the manufacturing yard, they'll often sit uh, in on building sites wet. So you can see here's a photograph from Mayo, and you can see that the blocks on the top of the bales are saturated and the ones further down are somewhat protected. So we have here a mechanism of how we're potentially altering the concrete before it's built into a wall. Uh, section 5.7 of this uh, EN 771 part three on durability uh, says that where the intended use of the product provides complete protection against water penetration, i.e. suitable air of render, cladding, inner leaf or cavity wall or internal walls, no free thaw resistance is required. But where it is exposed, there should be a freeze thaw test. Now this is, to me, there's a bit of a conflict here because the, the SR, the Eurocode is saying, inevitably it will be getting wet, the outer leaf. The data says they are getting wet. Uh, but the um, 771 suggests that, you know, it might be possible to protect them from render. And in that case, you don't need to require freeze thaw resistance. Here is one of the big problems we face, and this is that there's no standard freeze thaw method for aggregate concrete, uh, masonry concrete. There are for other materials, but not for these blocks. Knowledge gap two I'm going to mention uh, is male and suspected uh, pyrite degradation. And this has concerned me for some time now that there's often very, very limited evidence of pyritic oxidation uh, seen by petrographic, by pin section petrography and SEM EDS techniques. And there is almost no, no evidence of forceful growth of gypsum. In, in any of the material. And I've looked at a lot of this material. Uh, there is a bit more evidence based on the chemical analysis. So if we return to the notion of the cement content and we accept that it, the data is valid, it will allow us to effectively uh, subtract the amount of sulfur that the cement would have contributed to the concrete block. And then we can look at the total sulfur and the acid soluble sulfate uh, with that, with the cement removed, because cement uh, includes sulfur. So if we do that, what we can see is that there is some evidence for uh, oxidation of pyrite based on sulfate production. We're not seeing it in the thin section of the SEM, but we are seeing it chemically. So it's, it's a little bit of a puzzle and needs some more work. The other uh, points I would make is that the compressive strength for Mayo is quite variable. 
but commonly quite high. And this seems anomalous to the ob obvious extreme degradation that's seen in, in some of the houses. So this is my opinion that there is limited evidence for pyritic oxidation being the unequivocal cause of degradation in masonry from, from County Mayo. Um, so what we do know is that the concrete's wet. So that may have a big bearing. Okay, so part three, I'm going to suggest some new methods for assessment of concrete durability. Um, uh, test suite C of this figure three of IS465 actually allows other testing if specified by a professional geologist or cartographer. Um, it, it, IS465 also notes that concrete blocks subject to substantial ingress of moisture and or freeze thaw conditions can have reduced strength and durability resulting in disintegration. So it, it does pay attention to it, but it, it, there was simply wasn't time to try and develop a freeze thaw method. Here's a large table, which I'm not gonna go through in any detail, just to say that there's a whole series of other standard methods that for, for materials that aren't aggregate concrete uh, masonry, uh, which have test uh, free thaw methods. And uh, you can see there's clay masonry units and paving and uh, aggregate itself, um, fiber, cement sheets, and armor stone, different things. There are all the methods are slightly different. And I've uh, studied all these methods and come to the conclusion that actually None of them are probably based on a, a, a very well-defined iterative uh, approach to, to maximize the freeze thaw. Most of them are, are actually based on what was convenient for the lab. So the cycles are often in 24 hours or you know, once every week or something that would suit uh, people and their, their time in labs. Um, and the temperatures are all kind of similar, minus eight, minus 15, minus 18, minus 20 to plus, uh, well, you only need to thaw so anything plus five to plus 20. This is my lockdown project. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, with a guy called Aidan Blake, who's a refrigeration specialist. He took a commercial uh, freezer and he built me this freeze thaw chamber and it's modified in, in, in many ways. But here we have these cut slices of concrete cores saturated sitting in bags in the, in the freezer. There's fans to circulate the air and make sure that everything is kept uniform. I also have very carefully placed probes. So there's a, on the left-hand image, there's a core with a probe sitting above it that actually sits within it in, in function. And these probes are monitoring the temperature of the core every few seconds. And this is part of a, a manuscript for publication I'm working on with uh, Paul Quigley. So and that's why I have the, this image. Here we have what those probes are, are telling us. So the top left is, it's like a heartbeat. We have time on the horizontal, the x-axis, and we have temperature going from minus 15 degrees to nearly plus 20 on the y-axis. And you can see it's incredibly regular. Every six hours, this, uh, freeze thaw chamber will bring a, a concrete, all the concrete, and you can move the probe around and see the same response on a, on a pathway shown by the, the lower image. So you can see uh, freezing, frozen, and then a thaw cycle. Uh, it's very, very uh, regular and predictable. So it means that we can take different concrete blocks and we can put them in different batches and we can compare the results from one batch or from one block with another batch and another block. So far we've uh, relied on a visual assessment in terms of whether the concrete remains good, fair, poor, very poor, critical after intervals of, well now I'm working on 12 cycle intervals. Um, and I'll show you some results. So here's results from two Donegal cores. Uh, you can see 0, 10, 20, 30, 40 cycles. The upper core remains in good condition after 40 cycles, whereas the lower core uh, is 
actually falling apart in 20 cycles. It's in critical condition. We, you could easily break that with your hand at that stage. And this is interesting because it's showing us information that we may not have picked up on any of the, by any of the test suite A or B or SEM uh, analysis. So it's, it's something that's very valuable in telling us about the durability. Here's some Mayo stuff. So again, we have one uh, core that remains in good condition for the 40 cycles, and the lower one ends up in critical condition after 30 cycles. It also shows us some really interesting anomalies. So here's a core that intersected three concrete blocks, and you can see a mortar joint in the, in the middle, and each one has a different response. So the bit at the, at the, well, it gets rotated, but the bit that starts at the left and ends up at the top is intact at the end. The large bit uh, on, the, on one side is completely fallen to bits by the end. And I postulate that actually the, this is due to, these are all outer leaf uh, blocks. They were all manufactured at the same time. We assume they all had the same cement content, uh, the same aggregate, but you can see different responses. And I postulate that this is due to some preconditioning, possibly storage on site and wetting, drying, uh, or possibly freeze thaw before the blocks were uh, put into service. The worrying thing uh, is that if you take new blocks from around Ireland and blocks that do not have um, a, abundance of mica or pyrite in them, some of them are durable and a few of them are not. So here we see two cases, one that the upper one from the east coast, no known problems in the area, but you can see after 36 cycles, it's, it's looking pretty ragged. The lower one is better. So the technique can be used not only to help us understand the existing problems, but also uh, what may perpetuate in the future. And my final uh, bit of uh, information about water is that it is possible to have degradation without freeze thaw. So this is an image supplied by Paul Quigley of a, some block work that is beneath the sub DPC. So it is beneath frost depth, but it is heavily degraded. And uh, this is a problem because we, in the IS465 was written, we uh, believed that there would not be a large amount of degradation on sub DPC uh, because the blocks were stronger and they weren't, we, we didn't understand that the, this degradation could occur. And this has actually been borne out by some experimental wetting drying procedures where you simply put concrete into water, dry it out, in and out and in and out, and it can degrade. Certain concrete is not durable in wet and dry. And this is a technique now I want to develop. So this is a, a humidity chamber where samples will be automatically subjected to wet and drying cycles. So it, it, it will effectively smoke out uh, the problematic materials. And there's some very interesting and slightly concerning early results. But this needs significant research. I'd be glad to hear I'm very nearly finished. So on to my conclusions. Uh, like all standards, IS465 will be revised to reflect the current state of knowledge. And it can only uh, really use what knowledge is around at the time. Concrete is a complex composite material. And we should not think of its disintegration as being solely attributable to mica or pyrite. Water is a crucial agent in degradation of concrete and is really underplayed in IS465 and understudied. In the absence of standard test methods and, and numerical limits, which provide clear basis for risk analysis, professional opinion is used. Yet this is really unpopular as different outcomes are possible between different practitioners. Research can provide new standard test methods, which will greatly reduce the need for professional opinion and de-risk the assessment of durability. And research funding is urgently required, yet it has been really very, very scarce since the, the start or since before the, the problem became widely known about, and is amazing given the multi-billion euro issue that we face. In 2015, 
Paul Quigley, Michael Robinson, and I uh, had a short uh, GS, an application to GSI, Geological Survey of Ireland, short call, only for 25,000 euro, and it was for developing guidance and testing masonry units in Ireland. And the uh, application was rejected, and the rejection, the reason was the address problem may have multiple causes, which is uh, fair enough, not all of them necessarily related to the raw materials. It's rather a construction materials pro project. And in some ways, this is a fair comment. In other ways, it's not. The, this problem has fallen down the gap between, uh, I suppose, engineering, manufacturing, geologists. There's, a, there's an area there that is, has not been, I think, well served. And we're, we're starting to bridge these gaps. But we really do need uh, research funding. I have a number of uh, ideas. This is just a, a short uh, list of ideas of research topics that we need to look at to fill the knowledge gaps and improve the, the standards. I'm not going to go through them all. I very much welcome the recent announcement by Enterprise Ireland on the Construction Technology Centre. However, in the call for the expression of interest, uh, there's, it, it, the existing issues are notably missing from the quality challenge. And in the 221 page detailed description of needs for the Irish construction built envir environment sector, it only mentions defects once, pyrite twice, mica twice, and deleterious, it doesn't mention at all. It does, however, note that a renewed focus on standards and compliance is required by the sector. I was a bit disappointed because I thought that there would be a home for research <laughs> and concrete uh, problems and new concrete uh, in, in that document, but it, it just seems to have been uh, omitted. Finally, in my opinion, uh, that while most blocks are compliant <laughs> with the specifications and are durable, we have a problem that not all durable blocks are compliant and not all compliant blocks are durable. And this is a problem because if you think about not all durable blocks are compliant, what you may end up doing is pulling down houses because we've realized uh, retrospectively that the, the blocks are not compliant with standards. Uh, the other problem is in that not all compliant jobs blocks are durable, we end up with a, a major issue if we're making blocks nowadays that are, meet all the specifications and they're compliant but are not durable. We're going to perpetuate this problem. So this is where we really need to uh, work on the research aspects of these. And my final plea to everyone listening is whenever they hear mica equals Donegal and pyrite equals mayo, to try and think beyond that and think concrete is complex and think about water. And on that note, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you, Robbie. Um, I'll let you uh, give you a couple of minutes to gather your breath and grab a drink of water there, but thank you very much. I mean, that was a very um, interesting and excellent presentation for me. It's clear that you are a tour de force on this subject. I think it goes without saying, but in fairness, I think your style and delivery tonight has helped to uh, make a fairly heavy technical topic quite accessible and interesting for, for all of us. Um, we might open up to questions in a second. Uh, just again, I'll be give you a chance to, uh, to catch your breath. I did notice as you were speaking that quite a few questions have come into us um, tonight. I'm not sure if we have time to cover all of those. Um, but we will do our best to try and get through them, just as maybe a representative sample of what's come in. Um, a couple of observations for myself. I think it's interesting that you're highlighting there are quite a few knowledge gaps in this area, in this sector, um, even at the end, just to get away from some of the, simply, the simplified conclusions people may have from listening to this or reading up on this topic. Um, so. You know, again, from our point of view, as a voluntary committee in the Northwest region, we're trying to reach out to people like ourselves just to inform um, engineers as members of the community or the general public. So thank you, Robbie, again for that. I think that was 
very useful and very beneficial. So if you have a minute, uh, maybe 10 or minutes or so, Robbie, we might pick up on some of these questions, um, if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah, happy to. Yeah. Okay, and again, um, we're trying to, I suppose, just focus on technical anal analysis in this talk tonight. So some of the questions that have come in from, from uh, the attendees may veer, veer, veer away a little from that. Um, but one is, if I can just read this out, Robbie, mica and pyrite are not the only problem in Donegal. Sulfide materials are showing up in test results from, from Petrolab. I uh, would like to know what Dr. Goodhue's position on this is going forward for home and property owners under so-called enhanced scheme and under IS465 protocols. Okay, well, that, that is probably uh, covered to some extent in the talk about peritite. Uh, the, the, uh, I think it's unequivocal at this stage that it is, it's there, it's present, uh, and it can be in, in concentrations that are uh, potentially very concerning. But what is noted, I think, by most of the labs who are working on it is this uh, sort of disconnect that you can see there is oxidation of the pyrotite, but it does not appear to be in situ oxidation. It appears to have predated the concrete manufacture. And this is a, this is a real puzzle for us. And until we actually start to think about how we, we can work out the, I suppose, the time frame of pyrotite oxidation, we don't really understand the uh, the, the risk it poses, and it could be anything from quite a low risk to quite a severe risk, but we don't know. We need more research, I'm afraid. Okay, Robbie, I'll just move through some more questions that have come into us. Um, this one is a bit more general, and see what your thoughts are on this one um, from Porik. Robo, Robbie, your intro cites many, many standards. How does one, as a work practitioner, keep up to date with all those constant changing standards? I know it's a constant challenge for engineers and everybody in the industry. Any I think that's a that's a good question. It's a very it's a very difficult one, and I, all I can think of is that there should be sort of clustered uh, seminars of clustered standards, uh, where maybe annually, where there's a an update from NSAI or someone saying these are the the new revisions, these are the things you need to watch for. I think that might help a lot of people. I think the standards are uh, really ca can be quite difficult to read and you, you get a few lines yeah, into yeah. them and you, you find that you sometimes need to go and refer to another standard that refers to another one. So you, it, it's a big time investment and I, it is. I sympathize. Yeah, it is a constant challenge. Um, maybe again at the start, we did um, mention or refer to the um, CPD, um, I suppose obligation on members of Engineers Ireland and a gentle reminder again folks that um, you know you have to input your hours and CPD logs for 2021 by the end of January um, but I, I think it is a constant challenge for engineers and any professionals to keep up to date with the, with the standards. Um, let's move on to maybe a couple of questions from Danny here. I heard anything above 1% micro is much maybe too much is that true? Who is responsible for testing of concrete blocks for deleterious materials, the county council or the quarry? Uh, I'd say no, there's no limit set on the amount of uh, free muscovite mica or, or bulk mica in a sample. Um, it's an unknown. Uh, it is known that as you increase the amount of free mica in concrete, if you keep the other, all the other factors constant, that uh, you will end up with a, eventually with a material that's not particularly durable, but we don't know where that limit is. And you can compensate uh, sometimes or often by increasing the cement content. Uh, that, that would really help because there's more cement to go around and decreasing the void content would probably help as well. Again, more uh, research needed. I think that was part one of that question, sorry, I've forgotten part two. No, I think you've, uh, part two was... Um, who, who tests for it? Uh, was it the, yeah. the councils or the... Well, at the moment, it's the IS465 dictates that uh, labs test for it. Um, so the councils have no part in the, in the testing. 
uh, in new blocks manufacturers would they would test but they would usually go to an external lab to uh, get the te all the testing done it's not something that's required in the um in the new standard blocks as a as a limit there isn't a limit on a free mica thanks robbie um just even as we're speaking here there there are tons of questions coming in folks and it's, it's really not feasible for um for us to capture all of these tonight so i i intend to run through and try and select a sample a representative sample and um, apologies to anybody in advance if we don't get to your question tonight uh john has raised a query here Rob, you did mention this, where you have rising walls, but not subject to freeze thaw in blocks with micro, will they deteriorate? Uh, well, there's evidence now, I, I believe, um, that yes, you can get deterioration from in rising walls uh, beneath the frost base uh, in, certain, in certain block work. Um, I think that's something that I, I work more on the lab end of things, so it's something that needs more site investigation, probably. But there, I have seen photographs. Indeed, I showed one of uh, deteriorating block work uh, sub DPC, and we do see some samples coming in that are in fairly poor condition that would have been that would not have been subjected to freeze thaw. Okay, Robbie, uh, I'll keep moving again. Um, Another query here from Martin uh, is, in your professional opinion, does IS465 need to be updated to include all deleterious materials? Yes, it, it needs to be updated. We've learned an awful lot since this, this standard was written uh, and uh, it needs to be updated. Um, another interesting one here from, from Nick. Are cores taken from the blocks in a dry condition? If water is used during coring operation, it would affect the moisture content of the cores. Also, how are cores handled after removal? Are they immediately put in bags or are they potentially exposed to air for different durations? Yeah, the IS465 is quite specific on this, that dry coring is used and that uh, on retrieval, the cores are wrapped in an in a air a watertight container. Usually cling film is the best thing to put them in and then into a labeled sample bag. So they are, the moisture content is preserved. Um, Bobby, there's quite a specific question here from Eileen. I'll try and read it out um, for you. You might have touched on it a second ago with the, the water degradation um, item. So Eileen asks, you said there that their moisture is a key factor in degradation. However, given that there is also moisture impacting the internal leaf, although obviously at a much lower level, what Empirical evidence supports options two to five of IS465, i.e. the non-demolish options, given that anecdotal evidence is showing outer leaf replacement is the only temporary solution. It's quite a bit in that, Robbie, I'm not sure. Yeah, I can... think I'd have to, I, I, I'll have to come back, but I will, if you can get the email of that person, I'll come back and consider that. I'm not going to try and answer it off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, Another query from Michal here, is external insulation a method of reducing the thaw freeze effect? Yeah, that's a really good question, really interesting. Um, I believe so. And I, I actually had another proposal, which was also unsuccessful, which was going to take a property that was susceptible, but not badly deteriorated. I was going to put it, I had a company lined up to do um, Parex uh, acrylic render on the outside and um, then we're, we were going to put moisture monitors in the concrete box all around the house, monitor it for a while, then put an external acrylic rendered system on it, dry out the inner leaf, and then monitor it and see how it behaved. Um, so I believe so. Um, sadly, it wasn't funded, so <laughs> we don't, we're no further on. Um, thank you, Robbie. I think just as you were speaking there, a, a chat point popped up will this lecture be recorded folks i should have mentioned that at the start that yes this is being recorded and it will be available through engineers on the website and on engineers tv um probably there are tons more questions here i'll just spend a couple more minutes if that's okay with you we'll try and we'll try and pick up on some sample questions john has an interesting one here why is the problem more prevalent now and does not appear to be an issue with houses built in the area in mid 1900s what has changed uh, we don't know absolutely. Um, 
one of the theories is that the cement content has been reduced um, through modern manufacture processes. Uh, there's certainly some evidence that if in the higher cement content, the stronger blocks from the same manufacturers that are, have problems built, made at the same time are, are more durable. Um, so that, that would seem to indicate that, you know, you change that one parameter and you reduce the, the risk. We need to look at more. Unfortunately, we, we, all we ever really get to see are the, the problems. Well, that's changing now. We're getting to see some new blocks, but uh, you, you've really got to have an understanding of the good and the bad to understand why the bad is bad, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it is. It's a, it's a broad subject, broad topic. Um, a query here from Donica, Bobby, should predict practitioners be specifying testing of block work delivered and used on sites or relying on CE certs and declarations of performance provided by manufacturers? Not sure if you've got thoughts on that one. Yeah, I think that that's a difficult one. I mean, you you know, the manufacturers are following the specifications. So, um, you know, if you're happy with that, then that's that's good. If some practitioners are seeking additional assurance, but um, often it's it's just complicating things because it's it's a large volume of work coming in that slows everything else down, and it's just showing that things are durable. But uh, I don't know. Is <laughs> the short? Yeah, answer. I know. I, and again, in fairness to you, like this topic is on the uh, analysis of concrete blocks. So, as we said at the outset, there are many other factors um, contributing to this subject, and maybe there's another talk, another lecture in this. We can expand on that in the future. Um, just move on again. Maybe a couple more questions. From John here, should the plaster not be preventing water ingress? And if so, could replastering sealing the outer leaf protect the outer leaf from further de degradation? You've probably touched on this in the previous answer. Well, yeah, that it, again, that is an interesting question because the render should, uh, well, I, I think the theory was that the render would protect the, the outer leaf, um, but the your code suggests that in you know extreme climates, doesn't matter the rain will get in anyway um it's a it's a it is a good question and i think some consideration may be given to the the renders the types of renders and their their application in time to come robbie i'll, I'll go for there are 50 questions here i'll go for maybe two more um this one from jerome jerome any correlation to higher strength blocks ken newton are more durable than ordinary strength, five Newton, even with deleterious substances present? Yes, <laughs> the short answer, yeah. The stronger, stronger blocks, uh, higher cement content blocks, which are stronger, uh, and certainly in freeze thaw, are proving to be more durable than the lower strength blocks. Um, and the last one, we'll leave this with Mel. Hi, Robbie, thank you for the really informative talk. A uh, quick question in relation to queries from Mayo relating to requests for evidence of oxidation of pyrite to form other products, presence of secondary mineral and gypsum production. I'm not quite sure what the question is, but do you have any? Yeah, opinions? so this, this is IS465 uh, suggests or, or requires that the professional geologist will find evidence of forceful crystallization of gypsum. Uh, and as I said, this is something that uh, I've yet really to see in, in concrete blocks. So it, it is a problem where something in the standard is, is re required to be seen and you can't, you can't see it. Uh, I think it's an area that will need to be looked at in the revision of IS465. Okay, and that's it. Uh, thanks to everyone for the questions. That concludes the Q&A session, section of the talk and we will end the recording now. And um.